Up till now, all our examples have been in one single key. But the advantage of equal temperament is that you can modulate to all the other keys without changing the tuning. And indeed, key change is very common in tonal music, ranging from the smallest examples to large, long-lasting modulations. We will look at modulation in more detail in the next lesson, but here we want to explore what are called secondary dominance. This means taking a simple diatonic progression and enhancing one or more chords with its own dominant before reaffirming the main original key. Here's a simple example from Beethoven's fourth sonata for violin and piano. You may remember it from the lesson on punctuation. From measures 1 to 6, the music is clearly in A minor. In the middle of measure 6, the chord formed by the two instruments is a 5-4-2 of D minor, hence the C-sharp and the violin. The 7th, the bass, the G, resolves as expected to the F on the next downbeat. Then the phrase cadences clearly back in A minor. It would be a stretch to call this a modulation, since it only lasts for one chord, and there's no cadence in D minor. It's a typical example of a secondary dominant, 5-4-2 of 4 in this case. What this chord does is to enrich the harmonic trajectory of the phrase. It's no accident that it occurs at the peak of the phrase. A unique special event like this needs to happen at a special place if it's not to sound random. Here's another example. The ending of Bach's chorale, Ach wie flüchtig, ach wie nichtig. The chorale as a whole is in A minor. The previous phrase, ending of the first bar in the example here, ended in C major. A minor returns in the bar before the end, notice the G sharp and the bass. But the D sharp and the F sharp at the start of the last bar make up a 5-6-5 of E, which then, as expected, resolves to E. However, the following cadence is not an E, but rather in the home key, A minor. So the secondary dominant, 5-6-5 of 5, here serves as a way to intensify the final cadence, adding a bit more tension before the ultimate resolution. Secondary dominance can be applied to any major or minor chord of the diatonic universe. In a mainly diatonic context, they can add a bit of suspense before the following chord. Of course, one could enrich a sequence with secondary dominance, making the overall context much more chromatic. Here's a simple diatonic sequence, like the ones we looked at in our lesson on sequences. Now we use the same sequence, but enriched with secondary dominance. The first bar here clearly establishes the home tonality of E-flat major. But starting in the second bar, every chord in the bass between E-flat and B-flat, the home dominant, is preceded by its own secondary dominant. These multiple secondary dominants in succession create a very unstable feeling overall. It takes three chords and the rhythmic stop in the last bar to convincingly end the harmonic wandering. This kind of wandering is often found in sonata form development sections, where instability is a goal contrasting with the more stable world of the preceding exposition and the subsequent recapitulation. Performers need to be sensitive to the degree of accent created by secondary dominant in a given context, so as to give it the right amount of emphasis. One last word about secondary dominance in chord spelling. Always spell the chord as though you were in the temporary key. For example, at the end of the second bar in the example above, the correct bass note is F-sharp and not G-flat, because we are momentarily touching on G-minor. In our next lesson, we'll talk about voice leading and secondary dominance.